you have your Bible, let's go to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, we're uh, finishing our series today on solitude, uh, the spiritual practice of Jesus that we believe helps us cultivate uh, more of the Spirit in our life, be attentive to the Spirit, and develop the fruit of the Spirit, um, and uh, become more like Jesus, become more like Jesus, so uh, for the sake of others in our world and in our life. And over the last couple of weeks, we've journeyed with Elijah uh, from his beginning uh, in the story, uh, the beginning of chapter 19, where he journeyed into solitude, d- dangerously tired, just dangerously tired, just worn out by all the work he'd been doing for God and, uh, and just needing to get some rest. And so God met him there, let him sleep, gave him some food, took care of his body. And then he, he journeys from the broom tree to, um, over to uh, the cave at Mount Horeb and, and is there wrestling with just anxious thoughts and his mind is racing and God meets him there in a gentle, subtle whisper in the midst of raging chaos and craziness and, uh, that he's been dealing with. And today uh, we journey further into this, this solitude journey with our aim being that God is, is moving from rest of body and mind to the rest of soul. And, uh, and so we're going to look at this together, right? First Kings 19 verse 13 is where we're going to start. So uh, pick up right there with me. It says, And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in a cloak, or in his cloak, and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek to uh, they seek my life to take it away. And, you know, Elijah exits the cave. Uh, he comes out of the darkness into the light of God, and God whispers to him, and he asks this question that we talked about last week a little bit about how, how God is going to ask us this question of what are you doing here, Elijah? Last week I pointed out the idea that uh, not so much the question is important, uh, but but how the question is asked, that he asks it in a gentle way, and in, in this whisper of a voice in the midst of craziness and chaos. And so there's just this, this gentle uh, aspect of who God is meeting Elijah here, so he doesn't have to be afraid to meet with God, but he can just enter into God's presence knowing God has made himself available and has, has been kind to him. But, but there is something significant about the question uh, because Elijah's answer is the same as before when he was in the cave, if you remember. Um, I, I didn't just read the same verse that I read last week. I read a different verse. It's just the same words because Elijah still has the same feelings wrestling with, you know, he's, he's still dealing with the good, the bad, and the ugly. He's been faithful. Um, and when everyone else has not been faithful and people are trying to kill him. And so it's just a really a difficult, a difficult place that he finds himself in. Uh, but I notice a few things here. One, um, why, let, let, let's, let's deal with this question. Why would Elijah be where he's at? Why would Elijah go to Mount Horeb and meet with God? Well, because he believes God's going to be there. Uh, Moses met with God on Mount Horeb. It's also known as Mount Sinai. This is where the Ten Commandments were given. And so this is seen as a place where God um, has been encountered and been seen and been met by other people throughout history. And so he goes there to meet with them and he believes God is faithful. God has been faithful to Elijah up to this point, which is a beautiful thing to take hope in. He's been faithful to him uh, and he believes he's going to be there. He's going to continue to be faithful in the good, the bad, and the ugly. There is no better place to be than where God is because he is faithful to meet us in that spot. My guess is you probably have seen God's faithfulness in your life, right? Uh, I, you probably wouldn't be sitting in a church today if you haven't seen God's faithfulness at least a little bit or looking for God's faithfulness a little bit in your life. And, and so my guess is you've seen God's faithfulness, even in spite of your faithlessness, even in spite of your wandering, and even in spite of your leaving. When you, uh, when you come back, God is still there. Why? Because God's faithful and he doesn't change. He doesn't move like shifting shadows. So no matter what it is you're going through, no matter what it is that you're feeling right now, you can come to him and you can find that he will meet with you because he's not going to leave. He's always there. He's always faithful because that's who he is and and that will be who he always will be. 
And so why do we venture into solitude with God? Well, because there's no better place to be. There's no better place to be, especially when things are difficult and when things are hard. There's no better place to be than to meet with God because he will faithfully meet with us. But I also noticed that God has not done much with Elijah's pain yet, right? With, with his struggle. You know, Elijah's still talking about the stuff that he was talking about last week and the week before. And so he, he hasn't really done a whole lot, but he's going to. He's going to. So let's, let's look at this. Uh, 1 Kings uh, 19, verse 15. And the Lord said to him, go and return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael, the king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint him king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of uh, Shaphat of Abel Mahola, I think I said all those names right, you shall anoint to be the prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now, this may seem like a weird end to this story. If you're just reading through, you're just kind of like, okay, this is, this is, how does this help Elijah as he journeys away from solitude? Um, and, uh, and so, um, let me, let me break this down. Cause some of it has to do with historical context and all of that kind of stuff. So he, he says, Elijah, I want you to go to appoint some new leaders. And the first leader that he's going to appoint is a guy named Haziel, uh, to be king, king of Syria. Now he anoints Haziel, but Haziel will not actually become king for about another decade, for about another 10 years. But this is significant because this king will eventually come and bring judgment upon the people of Israel who at this time, as Elijah is speaking, have not been faithful to Yahweh, who have not been faithful and have forgotten about God. And so God is going to use him as a force against people to try and draw Israel back to himself. Um, and, and so we, we see like one of, one of Elijah's complaints is what? That people have been unfaithful. God's going to deal with that in his own time, but he's going to deal with that. Then the second thing you notice is that he appoints this guy named Jehu to be king over Israel. And this is significant because Jehu is the one who actually placed the order to have Jezebel killed. And if you don't, if you don't remember back in week one, this whole endeavor from, from uh, into solitude for Elijah started with this letter from Jezebel saying, I'm coming to get you. Right? Like that's kind of the idea. And, and so, so Jehu's going to be the one who commands that Jezebel be murdered. And so um, there's going to be a group of guys that come in and they're going to throw Jezebel out a window and she's going to die. And then Jehu's going to run over her with his chariot and then he's going to back up. And then he's going to run over her again. And then he's going to back up. He's a sick guy. All right, guys? He's sick. However, God's going to use him to deal with something that's going on in Elijah's life. And it's meaningful. It's meaningful. Then he says, Elijah, I want you to go point a new prophet. And this prophet's name is Elisha. And Elisha will walk with Elijah and he'll learn what Elijah's up to and what Elijah's doing. And, uh, and he'll learn kind of his ways of working and all of that kind of stuff. And in due time, Elisha will take over for Elijah. Now, if you remember from week one, where was Elijah at? He was in the space of where he wanted to quit, right? He just wanted to be done with it all. He didn't want to have to deal with it anymore. And what is God doing? He's given him an apprentice to train up so that he can no longer have to continue to do this work, but he can be set free and, and, and leave the work behind. It's a really, really powerful thing. These three things that he does, these three leaders that he appoints, is a really powerful thing that speaks directly to the heart of Elijah and what Elijah is dealing with. Um, and, and so we, we should pay attention to that. We should notice that. But there's something also I think that spoke most deeply to me when I was studying it. And, uh, and this, is, this, is, this is hopefully uh, what will stick with you as well. But all of these things that Elijah does are likely things he could have done without God. Everything he does, he could have likely done without God. He could have gone to some guy and appointed them as king over Syria, king over Israel, because said, you're going to be the king. He could, have, he could have, like when he left his servant a day's journey from the broom tree, he could have said, hey, bro, I'm out. Like, I'm done. I'm just going to wash my hands this whole thing. You are now in charge. Like, you got this. Like, he could have done all of this 
without having to journey through the wilderness, without having to go 40 days and 40 nights, without having to spend time in a cave, he could have just said, you know what, I'm done. Just you lead this people, you lead this people, and you take over my job. Like he could have done that without God. But he doesn't. He journeys 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness. He heads into a cave and makes camp. What is he doing? He's not fixing any of his problems by doing that. Can we agree? Like by doing that, none of the things that he is bothered by are being dealt with. But what is he doing? He's waiting on God. He's waiting on God. From, from what people have said about Elijah's journey from the broom tree to the cave is that it was a pretty short journey. Why did it take him 40 days and 40 nights? Well, there's this, there's this aspect of where we, when we hear something like 40 days and 40 nights in the scriptures, it can mean a def- definite amount of time, but it can also just mean an indefinite amount of time. It can just mean like, oh, this is just a period of time that he spent wandering through the wilderness. This is a period of time that he just kind of aimlessly was wandering around until he found himself in the cave and, 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 and made his way to the cave. And we don't know how long he was in the cave. We like to, as readers, read the story as if like Elijah showed up at the, at the door of the cave, kind of made his way inside, took a seat, and then God started to talk. But we don't know. Like how long was he there? The Bible doesn't say. So we don't know. And we like to assume that because that would make us feel better, right? Like when we come to meet with God, like we're going to sit down and he's just going to start like talking and interacting with us. And we don't know if that's the case. It may or may not be the case. But, what I, but what, I, what I realize is that one of the most significant things that happens as we journey in solitude is it teaches us how, and we learn how to wait on God in a new way. When we choose solitude, the reality is we choose solitude over a lot of other things. Think about that. You choose to be alone with God. You're choosing to be alone with God over a lot of other things that you could give your life to or a lot of other things you could give your time to. And they're not bad things, right? Right? They're not bad things. And sometimes uh, you, you choose to give yourself to solitude instead of trying to take action and do something that would actually improve your situation. Because we all know that some of the options we could choose instead of solitude would actually move us faster and get us closer to where we actually want to be than waiting on God. We realize this? We could take control and we can move faster and we can get what we want really easily. So if that's true, why wait on God at all? Why wait for God to speak and for God to move? Here's what I think. If we give ourselves to solitude, we come back to it again and again and wait quietly and patiently for him instead of seizing control and moving into action mode to do what we often do, he will come and speak to us. He will meet with us with what is, not what should be or what could be or what might be. And in that, he will reveal his will. See, solitude is the crucible to which we can discern and do the will of God. Solitude is where we come to grips with knowing what God has for us and what his will in our life is. But we have to wait in order to hear him speak and hear him reveal that will. Knowing and doing the will of God is ultimately what will bring rest for our souls. I mean, think about this. If you are doing what God has called you to do and you are doing his will in your life, should there be any tension? No. There should be a blessed assurance and a stillness and a rest in your soul because you know, you know, I'm doing the right thing. Even when there's external factors at play and internal thoughts at play, like you can come back to the the truth that I'm doing what God has called me to do and I'm doing his will. And that gives me peace of mind and rest for my soul. And when we act in our own will, because we're not willing to wait on God, that, that, that will likely, that, that rest in our soul and rest in our mind will likely not take place. I can personally say I have jumped ahead of God many times, right? I've jumped ahead of God many times 
and uh, and it's bitten me in the butt more times than once, and I'm sure maybe you can relate in your life as well. But there is no, I, 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 there, I don't think that there's a better way, but I also can't think of many other ways, many other options to knowing the will of God other than to sit and be still and be quiet and wait on him. In order to truly know God's will in the scriptures, we have to be able to sit quietly with the scriptures and meditate on them. In order to know God's will in prayer, we can't just run in and throw everything out there that we want him to do and want him to fix without also being still and being quiet to listen for that still, powerful, strong whisper. And so you have to sit in the quiet and you have to listen and you have to search the scriptures and you have to just be attentive to the spirit. See, I think that there are a lot of people who um, they come to me with big decisions in their life. Uh, and I don't think it's because I'm special. I think it's because of the title that I have and because I stand up on stage and talk to people about the Bible. Uh, and so, uh, and when people come and talk to me and ask me for advice, they're like, there's really nothing special about that guy. We realize that now. Uh, and the, the, the reality is, is like given certain situations, most of the time they like, like people somehow believe that pastors have this special portal to God. I don't have a special portal. I have the same portal that you have. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit of the living God. Um, and he came upon me when I became a Christian. And if you were a Christian, he lives in you and with you. And you can tap into that same portal to connect with God each and every day. Um, and you can seek after what would be best, which would be his advice, not mine. But this is something it's hard for me to learn. As a leader and as a pastor, I'm having to learn this. I'm learning this right now. That like oftentimes when people come to me, I'm not going to be able to give them a solution. I'm not going to be able to fix or explain what's taking place in their life. I might be able to relate with them. I might be able to pray with them. And there's power in that. And that's good. And I want to do that. If you want, I, I would love to pray with you. I'd love to sit with you and just... And, and, but I'm probably at the end of a meeting, I'm probably not going to give any sort of advice. I'm probably just going to say, why don't you go sit in the quiet with God? And I'm going to go sit in quiet with God about these things we talked about. In about 10 or 12 days, we'll get back together to see if God spoke yet. And if he hasn't, we'll just repeat this until he does. Because the truth is, is that the fixes that we are looking for, they don't, they don't come in and of ourselves. They don't come in and of other people giving us good advice. They come through the Spirit of God moving and working in our life and revealing God's will. And so my encouragement is, is like, if you need advice, like, get alone with God and wait. Wait on Him, and He will show you His will. Be still and quiet long enough to let the sediment of your life settle. Let Him help you deal with the external distractions and internal distractions, and let Him quiet your mind and, and let and then wait as long as it takes, as long as it takes for him to move and say something in your solitude where, where he, he shows you something. And if you feel like, oh, well, I got to leave solitude because I got a lot of things to get done on my to-do list and I have a life and all of that stuff. Understand that, right? Like most of us aren't going to be able to just leave life for 40 days and 40 nights, okay? Like that's just the reality. And so like these times are probably going to be shorter for us. And that means we're probably going to have to come back again and again for longer periods of time. Sometimes a discerning process or discerning God's will might take up to a year or two years. And we shouldn't move until we know his will because if we move without knowing his will, there will be no true rest in our souls. But likely there will only be further disruption. There'll only be further disruption. I mean, think about it. If you move without knowing the will of God and you go and you act on your own will, what is he gonna do? He's going to yank you out of that and put you back into his will. That's going to be pretty disruptive. Like whether you realize it or not, because he's going to have his way. He's going to do what he wants to do. And so it would just be better for us to do what he wants to do first instead of doing what we want to do and then him having to disrupt our lives to get us back in alignment with him. Your story and your struggles might be vastly different than Elijah's, but I think like the truth is, is that you're likely dealing with things that, um, that, that you, you can relate with a story, but also that you think that there are other people who can relate with your story. And, and a lot of times when we feel that way, we'll go to other people 
And we'll begin to talk with other people about, hey, what's going on in our life? And hey, like, have you ever experienced anything like this? And this is all really, really good. And it's really, really good stuff. We should definitely do that. But at the same time, uh, almost anybody you go to is not going to have the same exact experience that you're having. They won't be able to verbalize it in the same way. And they have a completely different personality than you. Like, most of us in the room do not have the same personality, which means we do not think about things the same way or process things the same way. And so whatever advice one of us would give to the other likely will not resonate or sit with us in a really, really good way. It might be helpful. It might be encouraging, right? It's good to have people to talk to. It's good to have books to gain wisdom from. It's good to have articles and posts that make you feel less alone in your struggle. All of those things are good, but there is no, there is no better place to go than to go to God because he is the only one who understands and comprehends all that we are dealing with and all that we are going through and all that we are experiencing. And so we should just go to him first and sit with him and wait with him. But not just that, uh, when we sit with him and wait with him, what we know is that he has a plan. He has a plan on how to move and work in the midst of what's going on in our life to bring him glory and bring you good. He has a plan. And so we just have to be willing to sit and wait. I like, uh, and, I, and I think we should take notice of the fact that Elijah's will is not God's will in this story. If you look at Elijah's will, he's like, I want to quit. I want to be done. And God's will says, get back to work. <laughs> Do you notice that? He's like, I want to be done. I don't want to do this anymore. And God says, well, actually, I think you need to go do some more prophet stuff. Like go appoint the kings and go appoint Elisha. And then you have to actually train Elisha on how to do things. Like take him with you. Show him how, uh, like show him the ropes. Do all the stuff. All right? And he will eventually be able to stop working and be allowed to just kind of move beyond the position that he's in and, and into something new and into something else, but not yet. See, he's in this... He's in this liminal space. And liminal just means threshold space or just transitional space. He's in a transitional space of this is what I see in the future and this is what's coming, but, but I can't, that can't be fully realized yet. In order to walk in God's will, I have to stay in the middle of the, the, the right now and the not yet. And most of us, in order to do God's will, we have to do that as well. And we look forward to a day when all creation is restored and there's a new heaven and there's a new earth. And that, that, that's, that's what's before us. And yet right now we live in a space that that has not yet been re, like seen or experienced in us. I think it can be right here and right now through the church and through, through like us being the church and being unified in Christ. I believe that we can bring more of heaven right here, right now. But that ultimate eternal rest that comes with the new heavens and the new earth, that's something that's not yet. And we live in this liminal space all the time, this transitional space where God is making all things new right now. And we have to sit in that tension. And there's no better place to go in that liminal space than to solitude. But it maybe, it maybe it's better said that like God's will is not in opposition to Elijah's will, but it's just his timing is a little bit different, right? Like, I mean, it seems like God is fine to work with what Elijah is doing, right? He's fine to work in Elijah's will. Hey, this is what I want, God. This is what I'm struggling with. And God seems to be willing to take care of that, as we talked about. Like, he gives him three things that are going to take care of all the things that Elijah's dealing with. However, if you notice, like, Elijah would like it done right now. Anybody else? Right? And he's not going to do it right now. He's not going to do it right now. And so a lot of times where we get hung up is not that our will is somehow out of alignment with what God could use or what God could do. It's just that sometimes we aren't willing to wait for him to do it. And so we have to be people who can, who can not just understand God's will, but wait for him and his timing to make it happen. Lastly, I like the fact that uh, God reminds Elijah in this time of 7,000 who haven't bowed their knee to Baal. You know, Elijah's feeling alone. He feels like he's the only one who's been faithful. And God says, no, you're not. 
there's this remnant of 7,000 that's still been faithful. And what that says to me is that God is showing Elijah and he's showing us that there's oftentimes more good. There's oftentimes more good than we realize. You know, you go to the good, the bad, and the ugly, like we talked about last week. And the good was that Elijah was faithful, but there's more good. There's more faithful people than just Elijah. There's more good than oftentimes we realize. And this is so true in our own lives, right? We oftentimes get stuck on the bad and the ugly. We forget that, man, there's a lot of really good stuff happening. God's doing a lot of really good stuff, even outside of my own life. And we might be thinking to ourselves, because like we aren't experiencing the good, that that means God isn't good anymore. That's not the case. Just because we aren't experiencing the goodness to the measure of which we find appropriate, doesn't mean God isn't giving an extra measure of goodness to all of creation, right? His goodness does not run out. And in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our pain, he's still good. And there's always more good than we realized. He's still working. He's still changing lives. He's still saving lives. He's still healing people. He's still calling people. And sometimes we have to get into solitude to remember that there's more good than we realize. There's more good than we realize. You know, solitude is that place where God shows us, shows us these things. And it doesn't mean there's not bad and ugly stuff going on. That isn't what it means. In fact, it means we can be with him in the midst of that bad and ugly stuff. And he's not going to reject us or forsake us or think of us as less, but he's also going to show us Man, there's some, there's more good clearly going on than I realize. And uh, this just reminds me of the cross so much and the story of Jesus. Like Jesus' life was so misunderstood for so long. The cross brought an end to the life of Jesus. And his disciples and his closest friends, they, were, they, they saw him die and they, they went into like this deep sadness and this deep mourning and They lost hope and went back to their day jobs of being fishermen, all this stuff. And it seemed like nothing good could come of that. But we call it Good Friday for a reason. We call it the good news for a reason. Because it's the most good this world has ever seen. The most good this world has ever seen is wrapped up in the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And what we think could be such a horrible, horrible like thing, and it was horrible and, and, and terrible, and yet it also was the punishment that brought us peace. It was the punishment that we deserve that was laid on Christ that brings us into the ability to have a relationship with intimacy at all. I mean, before we had to go through so many different things, we would have had to give in our sacrifice to the priest. The priest would have had to carry it into the Holy of Holies. Now the veil has been torn and we can just enter the presence of God ourselves through the Spirit. What we thought of as such a horrible moment in history has been the most beautiful moment in history. There's always more good than we realize. If we could just realize that, take hold of that, and remember that. Because to be honest, if we would have had our way, if it would have been up to us, if it would have been in our will, like Jesus would have never got on the cross. If it would have been under Jesus' will, at least based off of what he prayed in the garden, he would have never gotten on that cross. But you notice where he was? He was in the still, and he was in the quiet. And he was not asking that God do his will, but he was saying, God, reveal your will to me. And when those soldiers came to arrest him, he knew, it isn't my will that's going to be done, but it's going to be his will that's done. And I'm just going to be faithful. Be faithful to the task ahead. But don't you see that his will, God's will is so good. It's always better for us than our will. 
If we see anything in the death and resurrection of Jesus, that, that God's way, God's will is always better than our will. It's always good for us. Many of us, we don't want to give up our will because it means that, that we have to give up something. It means we don't get to have our way. Well, if God's will is in opposition to your will, you don't want to have your way. Can I just say that? Because whatever he wants for you is better than what you want for yourself. His will is always better for us. And so I know it might hurt to give something up you have really your heart set on. But if you give it up, thinking about the fact that you're giving it up to do God's will, it should be a moment of joy and a moment of worship and a moment of hope because his will is always better for us than our own. And the cross proves that. The death and resurrection of Jesus proves that. And like I said, Jesus will never change. God will never change. That will never change. So if his will is good toward us in the death and resurrection of Jesus, it is good toward us every time. Every time. Let's pray. God, we thank you for just the chance we have to dive into your word and to understand uh, just where we find you and how to find you and what we are looking for when we're there. And God, I just pray that you would just fill us with your spirit to know and do your will, to discern and do your will. God, call us away. Make us uh, and give us a, a heart to be to be committed to this practice of getting away with you, being alone with you, that we might know and do your will. Oh God. God, I pray that that today as we come to the table, as we take the bread and as we take the cup, we will see your will at work in our lives. That it was your will to restore us. It was your will to bring us new life. It was your will to give us hope and give us healing, to make us new. And yet the way in which you did that would not have been our way. So this is a moment where we can just sit and thank you that your ways are not our ways. And your thoughts are not our thoughts. And we can just sit as we hold the bread and as we hold the cup and know that your will is powerful and it is perfect. And it is revealed in the suffering of Jesus for our life and for our hope and for our eternity. We love you and praise you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.